This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So now we're going to look at value chains and supply chains. First of all, the value chain. And here is a, a diagram that's uh, probably familiar to you. This is uh, Porter's value chain. Uh, this is to do with the internal organization, really, of the, uh, the company that you're, you're talking about. Now, what Porter said <clears throat> was essentially the, that the activities of an organization can be spread over these um, nine different uh, areas here. Uh, the ones uh, along the bottom, uh, starting with your inbound logistics, uh, those are what's known as the primary activities. So here you've got your primary activities. And these ones here are, they could be called secondary, but normally they're actually called support. I've already said that really what you have here uh, are all the activities, all the things really that uh, a company does. Uh, and if it's adding value, if it does it right, so to speak, the result of this will be profit or margin. And I have to think carefully how it's going to organize these activities uh, it has to think carefully how it's going to do what it does so that a profit can be generated so we just go through what the the various activities are then we'll kind of explain it a little bit more and i know you you, you, you may be familiar with it but it's important so inbound logistics in, in porter's version inbound logistics is a physical receipt of goods and there are choices of course uh, you could receive the goods into a warehouse where they sit for a while. That's that's one choice of input uh, inbound logistics. Uh, another one is that you send your lorry out to, to, to buy supplies and to bring them back and then they sit in a warehouse. You could get a logistics company, uh, a haulage company if you like, to bring the goods to your premises. You might decide that they shouldn't sit in a warehouse at all but they should go directly on the production line so it's effectively a just-in-time uh, uh, type of manufacturing system. Uh, you have to decide maybe for certain goods uh, how we're going to make sure uh, that they're kept uh, below a certain temperature for maybe uh, health and safety reasons, food or pharmaceuticals, something of that type. There are many thoughts, so many choices uh, which are available in the inbound logistics. Operations is basically the manufacturing process, what's happening in the factory. Uh, it could be done yourself, but, but also within operations, there is a possibility of outsourcing essentially the, the production. That's a, a valid choice for some organizations. Uh, they outsource it to a company who's really efficient, operating a very large scale, so you get a great economies of scale. Outbound logistics, again, similar choices to inbound. It could go directly to the customer. You could use your own lorries, you could use a logistics company. Uh, the finished goods could sit in a warehouse for a little while until they're ordered by a customer, that's another one. Uh, the customer could come to you, uh, as they maybe do in many type of shops and so on. The customer comes to the shop and that's how the outbound logistics is actually going to be handled. You could decide to do it by essentially internet. Uh, so if you are uh, in some businesses, uh, if you are selling books uh, then and so instead of selling physical books you, you elect that your outbound is going to be downloading it to somebody's e-reader. Sales and marketing, uh, how are we going to make sure that the products suit the customers, how are we going to find the customers, how are we going to make sure that we can sell more and more to customers and, and so on, that's basically sales and marketing. Service is any real uh, effort after the main sales have been done so it can obviously be repair, it can be supplying consumables, it can be in some cases installing uh, your product at the customer's premises, it can be training the customers how to use it. Uh, and very often these uh, service areas generate almost as much profit as actual manufacturing. In the UK it's pretty common if you buy a piece of electrical equipment, let's say for the kitchen, well <clears throat> when you go to, to buy it, they always offer you what's called an extended warranty, uh, so the thing breaks down, let's say, within three years, 
uh, then it would either be repaired or replaced free of charge. Uh, and by and large, these uh, extended warranty contracts make huge profits for the retailer, but that would be a form of service. Firm infrastructure, stuff like head office, some something maybe like the accounting department will be firm infrastructure. And again, there are, there are choices. Do we do the uh, receivables ledger ourselves, or do we uh, go to a, a factor who will look after the receivables ledger? Technology development is basically research and development. Human resources management, the recruitment, retention, training, uh, motivation, appraisal, all of that goes on in there. And then in, in Porter, procurement, he splits out, not entirely logically to, to, to many people's minds, he, he splits out procurement, which is really the, the act of placing orders uh, uh, for both goods and for non-current assets. He splits that out from inbound logistics. And again, there, there, are, there are choices how you do your procurement. You could choose to have won the supplier uh, of a particular product uh, from whom you've negotiated a, a very good discount, or you could decide to divide and rule. You have four suppliers, you split your orders over them, and you play one off against the other. But th there are choices in all of these. Now, let's say that all of this uh, amounts, all of these activities all have costs. Let's say the, the cost amounts to 10 million. Uh, and the this is the cost and the revenue is equal to say 14 million of course there what you're going to be doing is making a margin uh, of 4 million so these are in millions and Paul Robert says this is a this is a bit of magic really how come you spend 10 million and other people give you 14 million uh, and it says the only the only logical reason for that is that you must be doing something uh, which they value, which either they can't do themselves, or don't want to do themselves, or can't do as efficiently themselves. So what you might be bringing to this year, <clears throat> what might be actually adding value is your know-how, that you could give people all of the resources which you have, and say, right, get on and make the car, and they couldn't do it. Uh, so, so, so they're not actually paying for the metal, if you like, that goes into the car. They're, going, they're really paying for the know-how, uh, which you know, designs the right sort of suspension, right sort of engine and so on, which they'd be incapable of doing themselves. It might be something they don't want to do themselves. Maybe they think they're inefficient at it. Maybe they think it's a great amount of risk. So again, in the UK, there are many older buildings uh, with uh, a substance in them called asbestos that used to be put in routinely uh, as a fire preventative measure. It was then discovered that asbestos, certainly when disturbed, can cause cancer, uh, a form of lung cancer. Uh, and so many older buildings, when they're being renovated, they have to have this asbestos removed. And it must be removed very, very carefully so that bits don't go flying over the, the neighborhood, so to speak and cause all sorts of um, illnesses, deadly illnesses to people. So it's a very, again, it's a very specialised job. Uh, it uh, needs all sorts of licences to be able to do it and so on. Uh, and basically, if you if you employ one of these companies, you're not just paying for uh, people to, you know, lift stuff and put it in a skip, if you like. It's not, not really paying for the physical labour so much uh, as, in a way, almost paying for that other company to take on board the risk. And then sometimes it, it may be actually cheaper to get somebody else to do it. Let's say for this business, I only wanted 10% of their output. So what I'm going to be paying them is basically 1.4 million. I'm taking 10% of their output. I, I, I don't need that whole factory. I don't need all of what they're doing. So I said to myself, right, instead of paying them, I will set up a factory of a tenth of the size. Now, you can be pretty sure that if you set up a factory of a tenth of the size, you're not going to be having costs of one million, a tenth of the ten million. The cost could well be two million, uh, because a factory, when you when you kind of shrink it, there are certain fixed costs which are there, which are not susceptible of being shrunk down. So it could well be that uh, you're willing to pay them something which includes a profit, because if you were to do it yourself, it would still cost you more. So what what you're buying is really economies of scale from these people. And what Porter said is you must understand what it is that makes you tick, really. Why do 
people come to you and spend good money, enough money to give you a profit. And you have to understand that, that almost basic rationale of profit making, uh, which your company enjoys, and you must protect that. Uh, if you were to, to do away with some of these services or products that your customers really value, uh, then you're probably not going to be able to make a profit. Also within the value chain, uh, Porter talked uh, a lot about linkages. You have to see how one activity links to another. So he was saying that you could spend a little bit more on maybe uh, technology development to develop maybe a better product which is more reliable and that might allow you to spend then a little bit less on after sales service. And provided the customer doesn't mind the change, maybe you're changing the substance that you've made the product out of, maybe you're using carbon fiber instead of metal, provided the customer doesn't mind that, then you're gonna be making more profit. Similarly, uh, what you might do is you might spend a little bit more on training uh, people. And if you spend a bit more on training people, then maybe it means that your operations here uh, are going to be uh, less costly because it's more kind of right the first time and it's going to be more efficient. So you have to understand the linkages which are going on uh, within the value chain and to see how changing one, spending more, spending less is going to affect another. So it all hangs together. Now, substantially, the value chain is internal. It's how you're arranging your own business. Uh, but, of course, no business really stands as no, no business is an island kind of thing. Uh, and most businesses fit into what's uh, called a value system or a value network uh, here. So here is uh, ourselves here. Uh, and we are, in turn, getting from various suppliers uh, we might be selling directly to a customer. Sometimes we'll go through a distributor to a customer and so on there. Uh, and, and what we have to understand is that every party in this value network has to be able to make profit. Uh, so the whole thing has to be arranged efficiently enough to eventually deliver to the customer what the customer values so the customer will be able and willing to spend enough money to give all of these people a bit of profit. And again, we, you know, we've got choices on kind of how to do that, uh, so we do. So here we have, uh, you know, one choice, we, we might well do both of these here, uh, but for maybe some products, we decide that the best way to distribute that to uh, the customer is directly from ourselves. Uh, whereas for other products, or maybe for customers in other areas of the world, maybe we have decided the most efficient way of doing that, and the best way of pleasing the customer, is doing it through a distributor, perhaps a local distributor who's on hand then to, to, to deal with problems and queries. Similarly, the suppliers here, it's been pictured that all the supplies go directly into the company. But again, many of these are, are going to go through kind of logistics companies uh, here who will pick up the goods from the supplier, maybe store it a little while, maybe do a little bit of work on it even, and then pass it on to the company. Uh, but whatever way it's kind of arranged, uh, the whole network must be thinking of efficient ways of doing it, because the more efficiently you can do it, then the better profits there are for everyone to share. Next, we have a couple of terms uh, to look at, and uh, the first one is already written here, is upstream and downstream supply chains here. People sometimes get confused about what's meant by the upstream supply chain and the downstream supply chain. And the way you want to think about it is, is you have your, the company, the manufacturing company, it's almost sitting on a river, okay? And we have the river flowing past or even under the company and it's flowing in that direction, okay? So the river, the water, is flowing that way. And you want to think of uh, kind of materials floating down the river, okay? So they float down the river, kind of through the factory where something is done to them, 
and then the processed products or the finished products then kind of float on down uh, to the distributor. So when you talk about the upstream supply chain, you're talking about all the stuff that happens before the raw material gets to you. So it could start maybe with a mining company which extracts iron ore, and then it'll go to uh, an iron, you know, people who, uh, well, a mining company extracts the iron ore from the earth, then it'll go from a, to a company uh, which extracts the iron from the iron ore, then maybe it goes to a steel manufacturer who produce rolled steel and so on, then maybe it comes to you, you, you press it, you make articles out of it, uh, and then you send those on down then maybe to somebody who assembles it, uh, and then maybe it goes further on down to the customer. So upstream is all the kind of history of the raw material as it kind of comes towards you. Downstream is then is what happening, all of this process material, components, finished goods, if you like, until they eventually get to the final customer. Two ways of uh, kind of organizing the flow of goods through here, you can have push and you can have pull systems. Now, what a push system does is the company says, I think demand next month is going to be a thousand. And the company essentially places orders for a thousand units worth of material, makes a thousand, and then probably puts that in, in a little warehouse uh, somewhere on its premises, uh, and then waits for the sales to happen. In other words, the company pushes goods, particularly finished goods, into the system. That's, if you like, a conventional system using inventory. A pool system, however, doesn't do that. What the pool system does, the pool system waits on an order coming from your customers. So the customer says, look, I want a thousand items. This is a signal to the company to say, right, I need to make a thousand items. And this then is a signal to the company to order enough material to make the thousand items. So it's the order from the customer which is kind of pulling the products, pulling the raw materials into the system. In the push system, it's the company which kind of puts them onto the production line and kind of hopes uh, that they're going to be selling. 